And when we think about staging neuroblastoma, there's a newer criteria that's being utilized within the last couple of years and is being adopted in our upcoming clinical trials here in the United States. And it's an international staging system. And the impetus for this was to allow collaboration and um, comparison of data, patients in, treated overseas, abroad, and patients treated in the United States. Previously, there were two different staging systems which made it difficult to really correlate data. So moving forward, this is the current staging system. And it really looks at classifying patients as either having localized disease, which are the L1 or L2 tumors, versus metastatic disease. It's a bit more simplified staging, and it's actually a radiographic staging, whereas previous staging was surgical. Um, the difference between the two localized groups, uh, one is a patient without what is termed an image-defined risk factor. So I think of this as a small, well-circumscribed lesion versus a patient with an image-defined risk factor where the tumor has a more aggressive appearance. It's invading organs, it's encasing vessels, nerves, um, and has an uglier appearance radiographically. And then our metastatic patients, as you would expect, a primary tumor with distant metastatic disease. And there remains the um, MS, or the special category, which is a young patient, in this case less than 18 months of age, and a very typical metastatic pattern. So metastases to the liver, the skin, and limited involvement of the bone marrow. So this comes into play as we talk a little bit about the clinical trials and um, where we're headed. There is quite a bit known about neuroblastoma in terms of prognosis and how we can use these prognostic features to classify patients. And I've listed this table here just to give you an idea of the things that we look at in terms of how to classify our patients and determine the best therapy. So the stage of disease is important. Age is also important. The younger, the better. We look at histology of the tumor, which is a pathologic distinction, favorable or unfavorable. We look at MCN amplification, which is an abnormality or amplification of a portion of chromosome 2. And if that is amplified, it portends a poor prognosis. Loss of heterozygosity, and actually moving forward, probably an expanded panel of loss of heterozygosity with a segmental chromosome aberration analysis is what's being done um, with current studies and future studies. And then DNA ploidy. So um, a, D, a higher is a better in the case of DNA ploidy. So taking all of these features, both the patient's clinical characteristics and the tumor characteristics, the tumor genomics, we can classify our patients as having high, intermediate, or low-risk disease. And that really relates to the risk of relapse, the risk of having refractory disease or, or not responding to therapy. And with that classification, can decide how aggressive we need to be with our treatment. And this is an older survival curve, um, and I'll talk about how we've made some progress and improved some of the numbers, particularly for the high-risk group. But I think this is striking in that neuroblastoma is a very heterogeneous disease. We have patients who have high-risk disease who are either older with a large tumor, um, a metastatic pattern, or unfavorable genomics with their, within their tumor, and really their prognosis is quite poor. We've made great strides, and again, I'll highlight that as I go forward, but there's still um, many patients who are not cured of their disease. Whereas you see patients with low and intermediate risk disease have an excellent survival outcome, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've modified therapy with this excellent prognosis. So very briefly, and this is quite basic, I apologize, um, but the th principles of neuroblastoma and blastoma therapy include surgical resection, or at least obtaining tissue for biopsy in our genomic analysis, chemotherapy and radiation. So those three things make up the backbone of therapy or a combination of those for patients. We are moving in, I'll again touch on this later, to more of an observation role for some patients. So they may not require any therapy, but for those that do, this is what we rely on. And now going forward, I wanted to just highlight some studies that have been um, published and some that are completed and soon to be published in terms of progress and changes we've made with the treatment for neuroblastoma. So this was a randomized trial that ran in the um, decade of the 1990s, but I wanted to discuss it because I think it really did change the treatment for neuroblastoma and it was really a remarkable trial. It was a very nice study in that there were two questions ants asked, and um, it was a randomized study for both of those questions. So the first question was whether high-dose chemotherapy, what we consider myeloablative chemotherapy, with an autologous stem cell rescue, so giving the patients their own stem cells back uh, to rescue them from the toxicity, 
Was that better than standard chemotherapy alone? Did that offer a survival advantage? And then for patients who went through that initial portion of the study and were randomized, there was a second randomization of cisretinoic acid versus no further therapy. And cisretinoic acid is thought to be a differentiating agent in neuroblastoma, so the cells are differentiated, become more normal, more mature, and the hope is that with any minimal residual disease, this would be an effective therapy. So the study really did answer these two questions, and I've shown, this, the graphs I've shown here are actually from the updated follow-up manuscript published in 2009, but they do show a nice advantage, um, particularly for overall survival in patients that re did receive both therapies, so both high-dose chemotherapy with stem cell transplant and cisretinoic acid had a better outcome, and it's about 59% overall survival as compared to the others. Um, transplant without cisretinoic acid was a 41% overall survival. So this really changed the way neuroblastoma, I think, was treated going forward. And for most of the studies in the United States and in Europe use uh, transplant as part of therapy. The next big innovation in terms of neuroblastoma therapy was using immunotherapy. And I think immunotherapy is a very hot topic these days and there's a tremendous amount of um, research and new agents that are used that affect the immune system. But neuroblastoma was a bit on the forefront, I think, of using the immune system. And this study was um, looking at a monoclonal antibody, Chimeric 1418, which is now FDA approved and called dinutuximab but it is an, a monoclonal antibody that targets the GD2 protein on neuroblastoma cells. It's highly expressed in most neuroblastoma tissue, but not um, significantly expressed on most normal tissue. So it's a nice target in that you will have a, a, effect, a greater effect on the tumor than on healthy cells. And it has its biologic activity through activation of complement and um, antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. So a lot of preclinical data and um, early phase studies led to a large phase three trial of this agent in combination with two Im immune modulators, GMCSF and IL-2, and again continued with cisretinoic acid. This was a maintenance portion of therapy. This trial took about 10 years to run, um, and that again was uh, started after many, many years of research, so it did take quite a while for this study to um, be completed, but the results were really exciting, and it showed another big leap in terms of survival benefit for patients with neuroblastoma. So this is um, data that looks at the event-free and overall survival. The top two charts are the entire cohort, and as you can see, there was a statistically significant difference in the event-free survival. And looking at a particularly high-risk group of patients within this high-risk group category, those patients over one year who are stage four, they also had a significant difference. So really exciting information. Um, and this led to a significant increase in accrual on the study um, and a tremendous bump in the patient numbers, but also led to FDA approval of this drug with a pediatric indication, which is not very common in our world. Um, this is not without toxicity, and I think this holds true for all of the therapies that we offer, particularly our high-risk patients. Um, there are, is a lot of added toxicity. This table was striking to me, and I think does um, in part explain why the accrual was low. We were really trading off a very well-tolerated oral medication, the cisretinoic acid, and asking patients to come into the hospital for a toxic antibody therapy, and that was a difficult sell. Um, but the toxicities have been, although the numbers look high, they're very well managed with a lot of supportive care, and um, certainly we get these patients through the treatment and the outcome is um, greatly improved. So moving on to the third um, study I wanted to present in relation to high-risk disease is one that has recently been completed, again, through the Children's Oncology Group, and it came a bit from the question of transplant and some early studies of whether two transplants, so putting our patients through two high-dose rounds and recovering them with their stem cells, would actually be better than one, so is more better in the world of high-risk neuroblastoma. So patients were um, treated with the uh, same upfront therapy, and then they were randomized to either receive one or two doses of uh, this in high-intensity therapy, and then continued on with standard treatment, which includes radiation, and as I mentioned, the immunotherapy. So this study has um, 
data that uh, looks at the three-year event-free survival to date, and there was a significant improvement for those patients who did undergo the tandem or the two transplants. Um, and one question was whether we, because this trial was ongoing in the era of immunotherapy, there were patients who were treated with immunotherapy and those who were not, and it was um, a possibility that we were actually seeing a benefit of the immunotherapy and not the tandem transplant. But looking at that question in particular and pulling those patients out, there was still an advantage for patients who had received immunotherapy. So it did not seem that it was um, purely related to immunotherapy. So that were the, those were the three um, recent advances I wanted to discuss in terms of high-risk disease and wanted to present a study um, that is, was recently presented at the ASCO meeting with the updated information in relapse disease. Um, relapsed neuroblastoma is a tremendously difficult disease to treat. Um, we do have therapeutic options, but they um, are often not as effective as we hope, so this is a very challenging group of patients. This study looked at a backbone of chemotherapy, temozolomide and arinotecan, and it was a pick-the-winner design, meaning they were comparing two different agents, temsorolimus and then the dinatuximab antibody that I discussed, and comparing whether there was an advantage to one or the other. And I've just listed the protocol um, treatment plan here. I just want to focus first on the top two lines, which was the initial randomized portion. So it was the uh, arinotecan temozolomide in comparison with um, temsorolimus, and then that combination with dinutuximab. And there was a very impressive um, response rate in the patients who received antibody with chemotherapy. So almost 53% of patients had either a complete response or a partial response, and then there were patients who had stable disease. And again, this is a highly refractory group of patients, so that was an excellent outcome in, in, and better than expected. They did continue with an expansion cohort just to further verify these numbers and further look at toxicity. And with the expansion cohort, that third bar, and then the overall I've listed at the bottom, really shows that there is um, an, uh, maintained an excellent response rate with this regimen. So this has become a very popular salvage regimen and actually um, in terms of developing further trials, how to use immunotherapy with chemotherapy um, more in the upfront setting with this excellent response. And I don't want to neglect non-high-risk disease. So when we looked at that initial survival curve, the patients with low and intermediate risk neuroblastoma have an excellent outcome. Um, in some cohorts, the overall survival is 100%, and um, which is uh, certainly a great place to be, but many of these patients are undergoing, in the past, had undergone surgical resection, received aggressive chemotherapy, not to the degree as our high-risk patients, but still at risk for toxicity, both short and late effects. So I think the advances that are really exciting in non-high-risk disease are minimizing therapy. So I wanted to discuss a couple of trials that have really looked at how do we decrease therapy for these patients and maintain that excellent overall survival and event-free survival rate. We probably are over-treating a lot of these patients. So um, I think this study looked at low-risk disease and was really trying to get at that question, do we need to do anything for some of these patients? So these, the patients included in this study were those who had a localized tumor, no metastatic disease, and a tumor that the surgeons felt they could either resect completely or um, attempt a partial resection. So the upfront treatment was the safest surgery that could allow the best resection, and chemotherapy was reserved for only a select group of patients. So not everyone on this trial got chemotherapy. Only those with or at risk for symptoms who had less than half of their tumor resected, concern that if the tumor were to grow or the symptoms would worsen, or patients who had progression of their disease after an upfront resection and no longer had resectable disease. Those were the patients that got chemotherapy. And the focus of the study in terms of looking at survival was particularly at a group of patients who did not have a complete resection. So I've listed uh, those patients as stage two here. If you remember our staging system, these were probably um, patients who had a tumor that was not easily completely resected, very close to vessels or even um, uh, wrapping around vessels. And with this intervention, with really just surgery alone and little chemotherapy or uh, select chemotherapy, the event-free and overall survival were excellent. Um, and it was interesting to note that the event-free and overall survival were comparable for those patients who had surgery alone 
or had chemotherapy. So again, a step towards doing less for these patients. Looking at intermediate risk patients, so these were patients who had tumors that were uh, could not be surgically resected, had either an unfavorable biologic feature or were an older age. So they had one feature that made them not quite low risk, put them in the middle cohort. And, but this was still a reduction in therapy. So those with favorable biology received four cycles. Those with unfavorable biology received eight cycles. And surgery was performed, the goal being a very good um, partial response or a complete response. If that wasn't attainable with surgery, then additional chemotherapy was given. So this was an attempt to get to um, minimizing therapy. For patients with favorable disease, this represents a 70% reduction of therapy in, compa in comparison to what would have been considered the standard. And for those with unfavorable, it was a 40% reduction in therapy, which is really significant if we think about the acute and particularly late effects of our chemotherapy cardiac and other things I'll mention. And I think it's um, encouraging to see that the overall survival at three years for all of these groups, unfavorable, favorable, and overall was really excellent in the high 90s. So further evidence that we can decrease therapy for these patients. And I did mention the, the reduction in therapy was very significant, and we have to think about hearing, cardiac, and renal toxicity, and that is probably unnecessary toxicity for our patients. It was also noted on the study the extent of surgical resection did not influence outcome. So an aggressive surgery with morbidity, potentially mortality, is not indicated in these very favorable patients. And radiation therapy was very limited um, in this study. Only a handful of patients required radiation. So for intermediate risk neuroblastoma, probably unnecessary toxicity. And I'll buzz through the next couple of slides. But um, this led to a, a very um, nice study looking at response in therapy and biology-based therapy in neuroblastoma that was recently closed through the Children's Oncology Group. And again, the message is the same. Can we go to two cycles for select patients based on their age, stage, and tumor biology, um, that, which is six weeks of treatment and very minimal toxicity? And to date, the analysis has shown that the outcome can be maintained for these patients um, with that minimization of therapy. So future directions. I have just a couple slides to talk about where to go. And I think looking at our original curve with the, with the studies I've talked about in the high risk disease, the initial transplant with retinoic acid, immunotherapy, and tandem transplant, we've bumped that curve probably closer to 60%. Um, low and intermediate risk, we're still doing great and we have minimized toxicity and minimized therapy. So for high-risk disease, uh, you know, immunotherapy is clearly an important part of treatment, and, but is there a better place to put immunotherapy? Should we hit patients up front? Are we missing patients that would respond to immunotherapy that are failing um, our initial treatment now? And that's actually in, in an upcoming study using immunotherapy with chemotherapy in a newly diagnosed patient. Are there new agents? I didn't talk much about that, but we have um, MIBG imaging that we use as staging, but you can use high-dose MIBG, which is actually a radio-labeled compound, allows you to deliver the radiation directly to the tumor. That's going to be evaluated as um, part of high-risk therapy, if that makes a difference. Molecular characterization could be a whole talk in and of itself. We have examples in neuroblastoma with ALK mutations and a drug that targets that mutation, crizotinib, and that's being looked at in the upfront setting. But I'm sure there are more, and people are really looking at the panel of molecular targets and what we can do there. And then I think importantly, survivorship. Patients are surviving high-risk therapy. The percentage is higher and higher as we go forward, but they really do undergo intensive treatment and have significant late effects. So survivorship is something we really can't forget get for this group. And we're in a very good place to consider that right now. And then for non-high risk, um, the, again, the goal is further reduction of therapy. This is an ongoing study with the, within the children's oncology group. And the only reason I put the whole schema is you just notice observation pops up several times. We're really trying to find in this study the best patient groups, those with favorable features, favorable biology, and can we just observe them even if they have a large tumor? If it's favorable biologically, do we need to do anything at all? And there's reason to believe perhaps we don't. And just a kind thank you to the Children's Cancer Foundation for the invitation. And happy to answer questions.
Does it work now? Yes. Holly, I'm Brian from Johns Hopkins. Uh, great presentation there. Um, one thing that we've been thinking about in, in our, I guess specifically our high-risk patients who haven't responded as well as we would have liked with the upfront chemo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the Curie score, right, who's high risk going into transplant. And so we've almost been, I think our last few kind of high risk patients, almost treating it like a leukemia scenario where we want them like in best remission as possible mm -hmm. going into transplant. Mm -hmm. And so we've been taking a few patients that are refractory and putting them on um, you know, like the Dynatuxmab, uh, you know, study up front, mm -hmm. thinking if we can get them into remission better, then maybe the transplant outcomes will be better. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any thoughts or your guys' approach in that, you know, I wonder if it's as much that or just biology, right, that this is actually a, a worse tumor, so maybe we're not impacting the outcomes just by doing that more upfront yeah. therapy. Um, so I don't know if you've had patients like that mm -hmm. or how you've approached them. But. And we've taken a similar approach where for patients in induction, if we haven't had the response we've hoped for. I've tried a couple cycles with the immunotherapy um, and actually have had some good success with that. Um, interestingly, I've, and I've heard it presented both at a COG meeting and then it was commented on at ASCO by the European group, but th we have always had the dogma of go into transplant with CR or as close to that as you can get. And I think that certainly does portend a better outcome overall, but it seems that there's a little bit of backing off from being so strict about that and whether that's as important to just getting them to the high dose therapy. So I've taken a little bit of a step back of what to do. I do still like the antibody because I think the response has been so good, but I haven't plugged along with antibody over and over. The responses on the relapse trial were very early. Um, I think the best responses were certainly by cycle six. Most of them were by cycle three. So I've just done two cycles and said, okay, this is as good as it's gonna get and go to transplant. Just have one quick question. For the relapsed study, mm -hmm. uh, the dinatuximab cohort, were they initially treated with dinatuximab? Have they been previously treated with dinatuximab? So they were, they were eligible if they had been previously treated. So some of them, the numbers were quite small, um, but there were a couple of patients who had been previously treated. They weren't eligible if they had progression on dinatuximab, but they were eligible. The ones treated with dinatuximab previously, did they have a response? I think one of them did. I, I want to say that it was probably five or six patients by memory, so it was pretty low numbers in that group. But there did seem to be something about the combination of chemotherapy with the antibody that um, may offer a distinct benefit. Thank you.